Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless the following movie is called the day after which aired in 1983 and depicts the consequences of a nuclear war <laughs> Missile warning, this is me. All confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. Roger, we've got 32 targets in track and 10 impacting points. I want to confirm, is this an exercise? Roger, copy. This is not an exercise. Sir, we need access to the keys and the authentication documents at this time. Can you have your key here? Yes, sir. I've got to go. Stand by to copy the message. Stand by. Lightning, 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 light
your communications with the capsule down there? Shut down the lodge. Even the radio went out. The radio's out. Last thing oh, I heard was that two of our radar warning stations. Where? Oh, no. Beal no, Air Force I Base, California, it. and somewhere in England. Can you in believe England? it? <laughs> they really got it done. It. They shacked them. They pushed all the buttons. You know what that means, don't you? Either we fired first and they're going to try to hit what's left, or they fired first and we just got our missiles out of the ground in time. Either way, we're going to get hit. <laughs> What are we still standing around here for? Where do you want to go? Well, how about out of here for starters? I gotta get my wife, my kid. We're still on alert, Billy. No one leaves this facility. Oh, come Not on, until man. the choppers. Who are you kidding? You kidding me, man? The bombs will be here before the choppers, Will. Listen. Damn. Listen to me, man. The war is over. It's over. We've done our job. So what are you still guarding? Huh? Some cotton picking hole in the ground, all dressed up and nowhere to go? He's right. Oh, Lord, Lord. What about Star and Boyle? What about him? What are they doing? Yeah, they're 60 feet down, sipping on some cold beer and whistling misty. Well, I'm going down there. Oh, forget you it, You can't man. go down there. That elevator's secured. You hear yourself talking, bozo? Because I hear you saying that we got direct orders to be sitting ducks. Guys, we got to stay cool. There's a ladder inside that So what? There's still behind an eight-ton steel door. Enough food and water for two weeks. They're not going to let you in there. There's still that little room off the elevator. Tommy, you know as well as I do that a direct hit will take out the main shaft and boil and start, too. Well, I'd rather take my chances down there. Roger, I understand. Major Reinhardt, we have a massive attack against the U.S. Net at this time. ICBMs. Numerous ICBMs. Roger, I understand. Over 300 missiles inbound now. your idea. No, not the hole in the ground was my idea. Yeah. Yeah, sure, man. Come on, make up your mind. Because you're either going to crawl down in that hole or you're going to shoot me in the back. So what does the book say, bozo? Baby, don't die on me now. Oh.
It was a movie like no other movie, and it had a profound impact on New York. That story next. We'll hear from people who, like you, watch the ultimate disaster movie tonight on television. Good evening. Here's what's happening. Most of you who watch the ABC movie the day after are probably still feeling just a little numb right now. Maybe you discussed what you saw with your family and friends. It still leaves you, though, wondering about life, about the world, and about what you'd do if you knew the nuclear missiles were, in fact, on the way here. Well, our reporter, McGee Hickey, has been out all night gauging New York's reaction to the day after. More than 700 people packed Riverside Church tonight to watch the day after. Many said they came here because they were afraid to watch it alone. While the TV movie was being shown, the streets of New York were a lot less crowded than usual for a Sunday night. Even in the Times Square area, which is usually so crowded, these streets are relatively empty. And ticket sales at some movie theaters were off by as much as 50 percent. Why aren't you at home watching the day after? Well, I, I had commitments and I had to go out, that's why. But I really would like to see it. I'm at work and I'm on my lunch break right now. But my mother's home watching the movie right now. Most bars in the city showed the day after on their screens. Business at this bar dropped off by half. This has been so hyped in the uh, other areas of the media that people are just sticking home to watch it. And it's affecting us dramatically here. I teach fourth grade at St. Anthony's in the Bronx, and I think that my children will want to discuss this tomorrow, and I want to make sure that I caught it. You could have stayed home. Well, I was out this evening, and I needed to find a place with a television, and this seemed the most appropriate. Once the TV movie was over here at Riverside Church, volunteers passed out pieces of stationery and asked everyone to write a letter to a loved one detailing their reaction to the TV movie. This woman wrote a letter to her two-year-old daughter, under the letter, a carbon to be sent to the White House. My letter says that um, I witnessed an illustration of the horrors of nuclear destruction and what it can do. And I promise her that in some way I will try to make sure that we never have to uh, experience that. Volunteers then linked the White House letters into a chain to be sent to the president. Riverside Church leader Dr. William Sloan Coffin, a leader in the nuclear freeze movement, then led a discussion. I think we have to be a lot more serious about disarmament. See, most Americans wish for peace, but they don't will it. And they want it in their shopping bags, a lot of other things that don't make for peace, like being number one in the world and so forth. As people left the church, mixed reviews for the film, but not for its message. I was bored. I thought it was a powerful movie, and I think it's going to made people more aware of the catastrophic effects. And uh, that's a lot of things to think about. Now, it should be stressed that most of the people at Riverside Church tonight said they had supported a nuclear freeze before seeing tonight's movie. The day after served to reinforce that support. As millions of people watched the day after, we visited with one family in New Jersey tonight to get their reaction. Paul and Mary DiPascali watched with their 11-year-old daughter. But they sent their five and eight-year-old children to bed because they knew the film was very, very powerful and probably too much for them. It was completely devastating. It was a horrible thing to see the reality and how fast it could happen. Those of us who watch it in the viewing public are, are not the ones who really should get the education from that film. It's more the people who have the authority to push the button. really happened. I would just want I would just want to go die when the blast and not have to live and start you could have to start all over again. I think I just feel a little stronger about the fact that we have to be strong. We still have to we can't leave ourselves vulnerable. All the De Pascales agreed that they'd remember the movie they saw together tonight for a long, long time. Well, as we've so graphically seen, nuclear war is, of course, possible, but not necessarily inevitable. The U.S. and Soviet Union have been talking about limiting nuclear weapons for some 15 years now, with some success. However, as John Slattery tells us, the arms race does continue. What we have seen, the missiles launched, the nuclear explosions, the devastating results was all fiction. But what brought us to that point is fact. It's something we've been living with for years. It's the arms race, with both sides able to wipe out each other many times over. Both 
sides have missiles able to deliver more than one nuclear bomb or multiple warheads. The number of U.S. nuclear missiles, 1,975. The number of U.S. warheads, 9,200. The Soviet missiles, 2,750. The number of warheads, 8,800. The Soviets' intense buildup of nuclear arms began 21 years ago after the Cuban Missile Crisis. They built missiles, we built missiles. Our thinking was the only way to deter an attack was to have equal nuclear strength. The arsenals were growing so large that finally both sides saw the need to talk. Salt talks. Salt One was an attempt to limit strategic arms, but after an agreement was reached, the Soviets still had the lead. And they not only wanted to maintain the lead, but increase it, which they proceeded to do under Salt One. Next, Salt Two, another attempt, but the Soviet buildup went on. We've made proposal after proposal after proposal, as the record shows, and they, they've just been rejecting, sidestepping it, making excuses, or outright uh, camouflaging their own buildup. With the Reagan administration, there was a new fervor for building defense and a continued concern about the Soviet threat. Today, in virtually every measure of military power, the Soviet Union enjoys a decided advantage. Much of the buildup has been medium-range missiles aimed at Western Europe. So the U.S. and NATO decided to install medium-range missiles of their own, 572 Cruise and Pershing II missiles. The first of the missiles were delivered to England just last week. It sparked protests all over Europe, and the Soviets walked out of the Geneva talks. The issue is so volatile because of this. Long-range missiles fired between North America and the Soviet Union take 30 minutes to reach their targets. But medium-range missiles fired between the Soviet Union and Western Europe take only eight minutes to reach their targets. Not nearly enough time to check out whether blips on radar are missiles or just electronic mistakes. Someone could retaliate at a mistake. Currently, in Europe, the U.S. is pushing for both sides to reduce the arsenals, but those who negotiate with the Soviets say what they want is clear. They would prefer superiority. Ambassador Louis Fields, who negotiates arms reductions with the Soviets, says he believes the Soviets do want to deal. I assume because they're involved in the negotiation that they want to reach an accommodation. They will drive the hardest bargain that they can. But they still want to maintain the edge. I, it is my view that they want to maintain the edge. Whether or not they can is another issue. They might be forced into equal arms. That, that is the position that we intend to drive them into. American negotiators are optimistic that arms on both sides can be reduced. And people concerned about the size of the arsenals say reduction is now or never. A report by the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons shows spending on atomic arms has ballooned. Nearly $100 billion has been spent by the world's nine nuclear armed nations in a single year. Nuclear warhead stockpiles have reduced since the peak of the Cold War. But new soaring expenditure begs the questions, why are these countries willing to spend such incredible sums of money on atomic weapons? And are they making the world any safer? And are Russia's threats to possibly use nuclear weapons in Ukraine just posturing? Or are they driving a renewed but very real need for rivals to build up their nuclear arsenals? Nuclear weapons. Mankind's most destructive invention ever conceived and then mass-produced. Since the Cold War, competing superpowers have subscribed to a nuclear doctrine that stockpiling these weapons provides protection through each side being deterred from using them to avoid the risk of mutually assured destruction. A new report from the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, shows that there are nine nuclear-armed states in the world. Combined, they spent more than $90 billion on their nuclear arsenals last year. The U.S. is by far the front-runner, spending more than $50 billion. It's followed by China at nearly $12 billion and Russia with a little over $8 billion. The United Nations Secretary General says the world has been extraordinarily lucky so far not to have seen global geopolitical tensions erupt into catastrophe. Today, humanity is just one misunderstanding, one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. The world's nuclear armed nations last year spent a staggering $2,898 per second, or $250 million a day, on both maintaining their existing arsenals and expanding them. 
ICANN argues this money can and must be better spent. The UN's World Food Programme says global hunger can be eradicated if these countries spend $40 billion per year on assistance until 2030. One year of nuclear weapons funding could also help cover nearly 30% of what's needed to mitigate and adapt to climate change. With conflicts intensifying, the world appears increasingly unstable, upping the risk of tactical or so-called battlefield nuclear weapons being used. A report by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute says Russia has five and a half thousand warheads. If we look at Putin's activities, literally since the first day of the invasion of Ukraine, he has been making nuclear threats. He has been talking about the importance of Russia's nuclear arsenal. It's nearly seven years since 122 nations of the world voted in favor of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Celebrations at the time. But the world is no closer to eliminating nuclear weapons. And the figures show the opposite is happening and the nuclear arms business is booming. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John was banished to the island of Patmos as punishment for sharing his faith in Jesus Christ. The Lord gave John a series of visions which described things that would take place in the last days. The visions John saw were recorded and are now known as the book of Revelation. In his book, There's a New World Coming, Published in 1973, Hal Lindsey writes, Although it is possible for God to supernaturally pull off every miracle in the book of Revelation and use totally unheard of means to do it, I personally believe that all the enormous ecological catastrophes described in this chapter, Revelation 8, are the direct result of nuclear weapons. In actuality, man inflicts these judgments on himself. God simply steps back and removes his restraining influence from man, allowing him to do what comes naturally out of his sinful nature. In fact, if the book of Revelation had never been written, we might well predict these very catastrophes within 50 years or less. Hal Lindsey wrote that book 50 years ago and is spot on with what is taking place in our world today. Throughout the scriptures, terrible times are forecast for the end of this present age. The prophet Isaiah describes the earth as empty and wasted. Isaiah 24, 1. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. In the book of Revelation, we read of an hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Revelation 3.10 because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The Lord Jesus warns us of great tribulation, which shall threaten the survival of all life on earth. Matthew 24, 21 and 22. But then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The Apostle Paul speaks of sudden destruction that shall come just when men are saying, Peace and safety. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. As these verses indicate, along with current events, make it plain that world conditions will be characterized by chaos, destruction, and death just before our Lord returns to take control of planet Earth. In the book of Revelation, we read about the poisoning of the oceans, the burning up of the grass and the trees, and the sun scorching people with great heat. The book of Revelation also tells us that horrible plagues will afflict mankind. There will be widespread wars and famines, and that the atmosphere will become so polluted as to reduce visibility by one-third. In the midst of all this devastation, the Earth's population will flee to the caves as people cry to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him 
who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. What could possibly bring about such universal carnage on the earth? Is the Bible describing a nuclear holocaust? Nuclear weapons appear to be specified in Zechariah 14.12. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. The book of Joel gives us detailed imagery that describes something so huge that it seems to encompass the earth and the sky. It is made up of fire and pillars of smoke, and is so vast that it darkens the sun and reddens the moon. Joel 2, 30 and 31 And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Romans 13, 11. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The closer we draw to the second coming of Christ, the more urgent it is that we awake out of spiritual sleep. We have entered the end times, and with it, the grand climax of human civilization, culminating in the return of Jesus Christ. If ever there was a time to pay attention and get prepared, it is now. Furthermore, none of us knows when he or she will die. Being spiritually prepared for the end of life should be our top priority. Jesus emphasized the importance of watching for his return as we read in Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watching means properly using our mind. God gave us the ability to study, learn, observe, analyze, judge, and think. It is our God-ordained responsibility to watch and pray for Jesus' return. Ignorance comes from ignoring, and God does not want us to be ignorant to the season of the Lord's return, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1-11. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. We need to know the Bible prophecies of the end time, especially the prophecies surrounding the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Jesus was emphatic that his followers should hope for his return, expect his return, and pray for his return. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation. Repentance unto salvation 
does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.